first of all, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here. Uh, we don't have a huge group of people joining us. So I'm hoping this um, will be an intimate and interactive conversation. We have four great, amazing panelists that will be sharing some of their thoughts and experiences and examples um, about how news media in Colorado can do better in terms of coverage, representation and portrayal of um, API communities and members of API communities across Colorado. And I encourage um, all of you to think through questions as the panelists talk. I also strongly encourage this conversation to happen naturally and organically. Um, and with a small group like this, I'm really hoping that we can really um, make sure we have a really rich conversation. Um, as many of you might be I'm at home, um, there's three dogs uh, somewhere on the background and a four-year-old. So there could be some background noise happening. Um, so I uh, ask uh, for some grace in terms of some noise um, that you might hear in the background. Um, and um, we will we'll get started already as people join. Uh, we'll welcome them at that point. And um, we'll just get right to it. So let's start with some screen sharing. And uh, this is uh, the API Voices Open House and a conversation really about working together, communities and journalists uh, to find ways to improve local news coverage in Colorado, more specifically thinking about API communities local communities here in the state and across the state. Um, welcome. The first question I want you to all be thinking about, uh, maybe later on share some of your thoughts or the answer to the question, what brings you here? I think both uh, panelists and our audience includes members uh, of you know, the journalism world, as well as non-journalists. And the project, which I will explain more in depth um, in a few minutes, has from the beginning had this vision of bringing members of you know, the journalism industry and not to have conversations about how news media can do better. Um, so there might be various reasons um, why any of you are here. And I encourage you to be thinking about that and sharing that with us as well. Please use the chat box to um, add some of the, those uh, that answer to that question now, if, if you'd like. And just remember this event is being recorded and will be posted up on the Colab website um, once uh, we, we are done. Our agenda. So uh, we'll go through some introductions and context, talk about what this project is, not just the AAPI Voices project, but uh, the umbrella initiative that houses this project. We'll have uh, the panel discussion, asking questions, open questions, and conversation amongst panelists after that. Uh, a section for Q&A. Again, I encourage conversation to happen between panelists and our audience members. And then uh, I will post a couple of questions um, just for the audience members, you who are here today sharing your evening with us to share some insights about what you heard and some of the things that might be missing in terms of the conversation moving forward. And then we'll close. Um, when we start the portion of the panelist discussion, I will ask that you turn your video off if you're not a panelist, so that we can focus our attention on the, the panelist. Um, and then we'll come back on video for the Q&A portion of the event. That way we can just focus our attention on the panelists when we're in, in that portion of, of, of the event and drop all questions that you have in the chat and we'll pay close attention to that. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Great. Um, so again, just to introduce myself, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Sylvia Solis. I am the Community Engagement Director for Colab. I have been a staff member at Colab for less than a year, uh, a few months less than a year. And my job has really entailed uh, supporting the team 
and thinking through ways to engage community members and communities, more specifically communities of color, um, in conversation to talk about how Colorado news media can do better in terms of representation, inclusion, coverage, and portrayal of communities. Um, so my work entails both work with communities as well as with our newsroom partners. Um, I will ask uh, Laura, uh, Frank, our ED, to do a brief um, introduction and just a uh, description of what uh, COLAP is. And then Melissa Davis will also provide a brief intro um, about our partner organization in this work, which is the Cardo Media Project. Laura? Thank you, Sylvia. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for making the time. I'm especially grateful to our panelists. Um, this is uh, so timely to be having this conversation today, as you all know. Um, Collab was born just two years ago. Oh, we're celebrating our second anniversary um, this month at the end of this month. And the intent of Collab from the beginning was to help bring community and media together to make uh, media better and to better serve community. So these voices, uh, working groups, uh, really are key to, to that work. And so the the fact that you're here to, to spend your time, share your, your insights and help um, make these relationships better is really important. It's vital to the work. So thank you for being here. Um, and I will turn it over to Melissa. Hi everyone. Um, so glad to see so many of your faces. Um, I don't have much to add, just really excited to be here. Um, the media project uh, got started and 2018, um, for many of the same reasons Laura just mentioned, um, we're a community-driven um, enterprise and are, have been, um, you know, bringing some philanthropic funding and hopefully some broader community support um, to the efforts to um, inform communities, um, inform and engage communities um, through um, the media, but also um, through all of the work that you are doing. So thank you very much and happy to be here. Great, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so to give you some context, um, early in 2021, Colab and CMP came together in partnership with the national nonprofit Free Press and uh, a project of Free Press called News Voices Colorado. Um, to think through and ask the question of communities, um, what would it take to ensure that local news coverage reflects, respects, and reaches out to the state's communities of color? So this larger question became the basis for a couple of working groups last year that met for a series of facilitated sessions uh, focusing around the needs and perspectives of Black community members and Latinx community members. Um, so it was two separate working groups uh, that met and uh, conversations that were facilitated, um, you know, over a period of a few months. And then that gave birth to a couple of reports with a series of recommendations that speak to newsrooms, foundations, and communities with specific action steps that um, you know, anyone that is part of any of those industries can really um, use as, as references to um, uh, put, implement and put into action some steps that answer that question in terms of ensuring that local news media is um, reflective and, and, and uh, reaches out um, to states, communities of color. Um, this is the third in that set of working groups, what we are calling AAPI Voices. And it's a space that is really dedicated to, bring, to bringing together members of uh, you know, the journalism industry and community members to have 
a conversation asking the same kinds of questions about how local news media can do better. Um, so this is an event that really serves as a launching point for these working group sessions that we're gonna be facilitating throughout the rest of this month and into next month. We're gonna have five separate sessions. Um, some of our panelists today, including Sarah and Annie, are gonna be co-facilitators um, in those conversations. Uh, we have three more um, members of AAPI communities who have agreed to serve as liaisons, and we will be also co-facilitating with me any one of those um, sessions. Um, it, they really are targeted um, for members of AAPI communities, but this event is open to anyone and all uh, just as an initial conversation and launching point for those sessions. Um, Tina Griego, um, who is joining us, has also been very much involved from the beginning. So I'd like to just, uh, you know, ask if maybe you can uh, just share your name and your involvement so far. It would be great to get your perspectives as you have been involved from the beginning. I was impaired. Um, well, I, I will say that I'm that. The conversations that we have had, the conversations that we're going to have, the conversation we will have today, they're all rooted in an understanding that things will not change unless we are willing to engage in harder conversations, candid conversations. Um, and I think that we enter this work, um, all of us, with goodwill and good intentions. And I think we also understand that goodwill and good intentions are not enough. And so I, I really am grateful to the panelists and to those members of the working group, um, to the journalists who have joined us tonight, um, to community members who are willing to take this first step um, in a conversation in which we look at coverage and relationship with AAPI communities, which are very diverse, and that is part of the challenge before us. And so um, I, I, I just, again, wanna express my gratitude and, um, and willingness to have a frank conversation. Thank you, Tina. All right, so I will move on to introduce our panelists. Um, if those of you in the audience uh, don't mind just turning your video off, so we can focus on um, the faces of our panelists, it would be great. I know Annie, you're not on video and that's okay, um, but that that would be very helpful. So um, Harry Budisidarta um, is joining us. He's the executive director of the Asian Pacific Development Center. Um, Harry received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from California State University of Los Angeles and his Juris Doctor from the University of Colorado Law School. Um, as part of his job at the Asian Pacific Development Center, Harry works with government officials and community organizations to address health disparities in the refugee and immigrant communities. I've seen Harry in a couple of, of uh, panels, um, and I know that he's talked about and, and has uh, thought a lot about um, this whole issue around news media and um, the relationship uh, between, you know, AAPI communities and the news media. So thank you, Harry, for being here. Um, Annie Van Dan. Uh, hi, Annie. It's good to see you. Um, uh, she's the co-founder of Asian Avenue Magazine, a Denver monthly publication that has now served the community for over 15 years, provide, providing Asian cultural news and information. Um, Annie's uh, family immigrated from Taipei to Denver um, in the 80s, and she studied journalism at the University of Missouri. Um, thank you, Annie, for being here. Sarah Moore uh, is the executive director of the Cardo Dragon uh, Boat. Uh, the umbrella organization that encompasses the Colorado Dragon Boat Festival, the Colorado Dragon Film Festival, which just happened, um, I hear was very successful um, this year with a lot of uh, really good attendance, and the Emerging Leaders Program. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Allied, um, Allied 
health sciences with a minor in biology at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Good to see you, Sarah. And uh, T. Vo is a reporter uh, for the Clara Sun. Before that, she worked for, for uh, ProPublica's election land project, uh, tracking voting trends in the 2020 election, cover local government for the Mercury News in San Jose, and reported on city halls and immigrant communities in Orange County, California, where she grew up. Um, T graduated from Haven, Haverford College with a degree in political science. Thanks for being here, uh, T. Um, so uh, just to rem remind everyone, we'll have uh, about 15 minutes of Q&A after we go through some conversation and questions with the panelists. So drop any questions you have for them in the chat and we'll make sure to come back to that um, after our conversation. Um, so as I think uh, we emphasized in the Evan Bright and the announcement for this panel event, uh, today is the first anniversary of the 2021 Atlanta shootings. And as we remember the victims of uh, the shootings a year after the tragedy, um, I'd like to ask uh, our panelists, um, starting with uh, T, if, if, if you're okay with sharing your thoughts, um, some examples you remember um, seeing of the good, the bad, and the ugly of you know, AAPA portrayal in the news during that time, and also your experience as a journalist, uh, where you were at the time, uh, what might be some reactions um, that you can share with our uh, participants today in terms of the coverage that you saw happen a year ago? Yeah, um, thanks for having me as well. Um, so I think a lot of the mistakes in journalism tend to happen in like the moment of a breaking news situation, which is what this was. And um, there are just a lot of examples in this one, like, um, you know, the one that really sticks out in my mind was um, when law enforcement came out and said, you know, said this was chalked this all up to like a sex addiction issue rather than like acknowledgement of any kind of um, racism. And a lot of media outlets um, kind of just reported that without taking a, you know, taking a beat to talk to anyone else about it. There weren't a lot of Asian Americans being interviewed in these like early moments. Um, you saw newscasters getting people's names wrong, saying their names wrong. Um, you know, one a journalist for the Sacramento Bee who's Korean American had a Twitter thread in the early days of the coverage talking about um, the fact that a lot of Korean speakers weren't interviewed by most mainstream media outlets. And he actually had found a bunch of coverage in um, Korean language ethnic media and highlighted that, look, someone's doing it. Why aren't we working together? And so um, those are just a few examples. Um, I have to confess that I think on that day, I was so overwhelmed by this that I couldn't read that much about it. And um, I think a lot of people felt the same way. But like one other thing I wanted to mention too was, I was sitting on the house floor on the floor of the state house um, that the morning after the shooting. And um, so the state representatives were talking about um, the incident and um, one state representative, Matt Soper, he's from Mesa County and his wife is Taiwanese, um, was talking about how, you know, there's 200,000 Asian Americans um, and that in, you know, in the state. And he noted that once a reporter asked his wife if she was a citizen and that, you know, acknowledged that that was only based on the fact that she looked different from, from him. But then, you know, and I appreciated that and that he tried to bring that into um, the conversation. But then he went on to say, to talk about how Asian populations are um, unlike any other in the state, that, you know, Asians are the highest earners. They're the least likely to be on public assistance. Um, high percentages of business ownership. And that was just like, like model minority narrative, like right away. And I was really disappointed to hear that. And so I thought that was a good example of um, how a lack of nuance in the conversation can just immediately invade an issue when something emotional and violent and really tragic happens. Yeah, thank you, T. I, I'm wondering from any of the other panelists, um, any reactions to a follow-up question around 
uh, some of those myths that exist in the historical narrative um, that really inform the stories and coverage. Um, T talks about this model minority, uh, but I'd like to know your, your thoughts in terms of the impact of some of these stereotypes and myths that come into play. I can give you a more recent examples too regarding this. I mean, oftentimes members of the Asian community were often portrayed and seen as like the perpetual foreigner regardless of you know whether we have been in the country for many generations, whether we are US citizens. A recent example I can give you is the coverage of the Olympic Games in Beijing that just happened a few months ago. You know, we had uh, you know, one of the athletes, Eileen Gu, received a lot of negative portrayal because she chose to play for China and there are you know media articles and personalities that call literally call her traitor. How could she betray her country, you know, her country, America, things like that? But then completely ignore the fact that there is a Chinese hockey team where 18 of the 22 players were non-Chinese. Most of them were white dudes from America. Not a single article is written questioning whether or not these white dudes abandoned their citizenship for being a traitor. So that's a more recent example of how this kind of stereotype still linger and still affects portrayal of our community. Yeah, I agree. I think it has been an issue since we've been in in the U.S. Um, the model minority myth is is real, and I do think that we've had a lot more conversations um, in the past two years about how it is a myth and how it has affected our community um, in a not positive way, um, regardless of the fact that some people would say that, no, you're a model minority. That's a good thing. No, it is, it is not. Um, and just as T was mentioning a lot of um, the things that were said, um, that Asian businesses are thriving or that we make the most um, income that just isn't accurate. Um, and I do think that a lot of stereotypes, I mean, everybody is subjected to stereotypes, um, especially the minority communities. And I feel like it has really been um, a negative impact on the AAPI community. Um, and it is uh, kind of added to how we are portrayed in media. Um, for instance, I feel like maybe when there's a media coverage on education, I feel like AAPI is usually mentioned in that um, or something along those lines. Um, and then to Harry's point as well with the Olympics, that uh, story was very one-sided and very much based on a, on a stereotype in the way that someone looks. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Harry, for your thoughts. Um, Annie, um, from your perspective, I mean, thinking more about um, your work as a journalist and also leading this more of an ethnic media outlet, um, can you think of um, back to a year ago um, after the shootings, um, some other examples that might be telling of uh, the narrative that was told at that point. And um, can you think of how that has evolved or not? And how does that really inform the work that you do um, from your perspective and in, um, in, 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 in your work? Uh, so something that comes up like in addition to what T was talking about was that a lot of the coverage was around whether or not these women were sex workers. And, you know, looking back even a year from now, it's like this conversation still is aligning Asian, you know, families that own massages to that. And I think that was really difficult and, you know, painful in different ways too. You know, a lot of these women that were victims of that shooting were mothers and, you know, the kids were just saying like, this is not even who my mom is and just how somehow like that, you know, connection was made there. And um, a lot of the conversation started being about sex work, you know? And so I think even now we, we don't know, you know? And so it's like, how, you know, is the media doing its job to really kind of tell the stories of the individuals? So I will say that yesterday we did have an event in the Colorado community to honor the victims um, of Atlanta and then all just the victims over the past year or two years um, to Asian hate. And so I you know, did do quite a bit of research kind of looking up the stories of all the victims again so that we could kind of honor them in a way that 
you know, wasn't just saying their name, but we actually just, you know, described them based off of what the families had said. And so most of the articles that I could find, you know, a lot of them were by like NBC Asian America. So in some ways it's still like, you know, if the media, this media at large doesn't really elevate the stories of kind of the ethnic communities as much, right? And so it's like specifically because NBC has this focus on Asian American stories, a lot of the things, like all I could find really was from that, you know, even we know like Next Shark is just um, kind of a more social media platform for our community that tells a lot of our stories and that's where we have to get that information. So um, it just still feels like, when we think back to that time, when we try to just localize this whole thing, you know, immediately after the Atlanta shooting, and so granted it did not happen in Colorado, right? Um, the Boulder shooting happened that like following week. And so I think it was hard for our community in the sense that um, it was the sudden kind of attention that, you know, maybe the Asian community never really received. And sure Harry received a lot of calls and at the time you know our community was just kind of working together to figure out how to respond to all these different requests of you know just making comments on different things and what are we all going to be doing you know we held a town hall right away and um but then to literally like the next week have the focus be on you know the boulder shooting I think that was just really difficult to be like, okay, well, we're trying to have this momentum where we wanted to kind of leverage this sudden, you know, attention on our community that we really never had before. And then it just shifted like so quickly. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. So um, T, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I just wanted to add something on the um, conversation about the impact of like the model minority myth. Um, it also is used to like harm and, you know, Asian Americans play into the narrative too. Um, so there's a lot of complicity there, but it plays into, it's, it's used to harm other communities of color and harm the relationships that we have together. And it's a complicated political narrative that um, makes it easy to say there's a good type of minority and there's a bad type of minority. And so when, you know, we look at the coverage of um, hate crimes over the last couple of years or the last two years, um, some of the perpetrators have been black and that has, you know, sparked a really complicated, nar complicated narrative in the black community and the Asian American community and like um, POC spaces that we really need to acknowledge and just failing to be precise. And the, the fact is that the myth is not true. It's true in some circumstances, but it's complicated and it's harmful. So as journalists, we also need to think about like the, what we owe to all of our audiences. And this is something that you just can't ignore when you're talking about API communities or other communities. Great, yeah, thank you, T. Um, I wanna touch on something um, Annie said um, in reference to how community leaders and organizations uh, that serve a API communities have to sometimes respond to requests from media and the relationship that exists and has existed for some time between, you know, organizational leaders and the news media. So um, Harry, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know as a community and organizational leader, what has been your relationship with the local news media over the years? And um, has that changed um, or not? And how is that impacted by situations of, you know, crisis or emergency where you have to step in as a representative and um, serve as a source for local news media? I think the relationship is growing stronger and getting better. I mean, I remember when I first started as a when I first started working at APDC, the media would really only approach us when it's election time and only because our office is in CD6 back when Congressman Mike Kaufman was there and it's one of the most swing districts. So the media would always come to us and say, oh my God, there's an Asian swing vote here. I can talk about this issue and not, you know, and finally have a new angle to work on. And then I think over the years, uh, the relationship has ebbed and flowed depending on the reporter, right? I mean, you know, we, we used to have great relationship with some of the reporters in Channel 9. They would come, they would work with some of the 
community navigators that we have, they do stories that are not dramatic or not about trauma, but just like showcasing the normal side of the community. But then those reporters left or they were fired. And then now we have to deal with new reporters again. I remember when after the Atlanta mass shooting happened, I, I mean, I think all of us on this call just got absolutely flooded with Twitter texts, phone calls, emails for questions. Um, you know, I wish that we have more of a relationship. I know we've done more of that panels, reaching out to some of the management in organizations like Nine News, so that way, you know, we want our stories to be told, and we also want to help your new station develop more of that, you know, list of local leaders. So that way, it's not just us responding to all of the questions. We don't want to be your gatekeeper. You want you to also talk to other people in the community as well. So I think, yeah, I. I have, I personally have not had a bad experience with a new story in Colorado, but there are different qualities, obviously. Some new stories were pretty generic and pretty basic. Others were much more detailed and more nuanced. Usually the stories written by reporters of color tends to be better and more nuanced. But I would say, yeah, there's definitely room for us to grow and improve. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. And and Sarah, I, I'd love for you to add some thoughts um, as an organizational leader to that same question. You know, what has your relationship been? How is that impacted in terms of crisis um, or when tragedy hits? But also, um, I'd love to know maybe some of your thoughts in terms of what are some of the unique challenges that you, from your perspective, um, might be more specific to AAPI communities and uh, AAPI serving organizations in terms of their relationships with the uh, news media? Yeah, um, definitely. So the words that um, Harry used, ebbs and flows, I think is is perfect for um, the relationship that I personally have seen through Colorado Dragon Boat, um, our organization and the media. Um, we are a very um, older, old organization. We started in 2001 and I just started about five years ago. So this is just my personal experience, but I do know that um, in the past we've had a lot of media coverage and then it just kind of dropped um, and then it would come back up during the uh, festival time. Um, and and just as Harry had mentioned, I really do think that had to do with a lot of um, uh, turnover in, in the media and especially with um, people of color working for those organizations or companies or not. Um, we do tend to get a lot more coverage when we have representation at um, the media um, outlets. And um, I would say that for us, um, we are actually, we're the largest Dragon Boat Festival in the country. Um, we do uh, bring in quite a few individuals and families and, and groups, um, not only AAPI, but general public as well. So we are a very large event. So we have had at least some coverage every year, which is which is great. Um, but I would say that we're, we're not the only organization that's putting on meaningful and amazing events. There are quite a few smaller organizations um, that are also doing amazing work that should be covered. Um, and I do, don't think that they have the same amount of resources or, or maybe in clout um, that uh, Colorado Dragon Boat has that has really drawn media to, to them. Um, so just to echo again what Harry was saying, just the resources between both the media and the AAPI organizations, I really do think there needs to be just more community and more knowledge around who um, runs what organizations, where you can go to um, to uh, figure out who to contact. Um, even just like a list <laughs> would be absolutely amazing. That's um, that uh, gets edited every now and then because, as we know, um, nonprofits, organizations, media. There's so much turnover um, that. We once you lose that contact, you kind of lose your foot in the door. And that I think has happened a lot with um, at least our organization and smaller organizations when it comes to new news coverage. Um, and along with that, with uh, resources is just really, I would say a list of community members to contact, um, not just uh, the maybe top five, we would like, love to expand that um, just because uh, I think as we mentioned, AAPI covers a very large range of communities and cultures and traditions, and we don't speak for all of them. That is 
we we speak for our specific silo and we can connect, um, but we would love to connect you with with the right people. Um, so just getting that um, in front of people and and even resources such as language barriers, I think would um, is is a barrier for our community as well as probably a lot of other minorities as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and yeah, I just want to echo what Laura said in the chat um, that we have had that request before in terms of directory and um, having some kind of list. So it's definitely something that we are um, looking into and, and it might be something that we can work on together. And I, I want to take what you said about representation and turn that over to T um, and um, Thinking about representation in the media, having those members of AAPI communities being part of uh, the journalism industry and having them be the ones who are doing the reporting and the connecting. Um, and then how does that, from your perspective, in terms of barriers and challenges, um, is, is, is that beneficial? To what point? What has been your experience in really being able to connect more with those communities and bring more of that representation and accurate representation into the stories and 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 your work yeah um you know it kind of cuts both ways in a newsroom depending on what you cover and and what room you're given to cover things um like in colorado and i've only been here for about a year and a half i mostly covered like the state house and politics and so it's kind of like a little sort of like limited bubble of, of the world and i haven't been great about venturing outside of it um in other roles you um like general assignment roles um etc you have a bit more latitude and so i think it depends somewhat on that um you know, it's hard because I think for a lot of us, we're often the only Asian in the room or just among very few. And so um, it can be difficult to start a conversation sometimes within a newsroom and um, have confidence in what you're saying. Because like, you know, for me, I, I don't always think I'm right or I want someone to bounce an idea off of and have a gut check with about how I cover something or what words I use or, or that kind of thing. But there's not always someone to dialogue with, which is hard and can be isolating when you're making judgment calls, especially like really high pressure ones. And so that can be difficult. It's, it's always easier when there's other people of color in the room. Um, but that's certainly a challenge. Um, you know, I will say like... Um, when I started my career, I was covering um, the community that I grew up in. And that was um, in Orange County where there's a very large, it's a majority minority county at this point. Um, the Vietnamese American population, that's my background, um, was the largest um, outside of the country itself, the country of Vietnam itself. And so there's this huge community, but um, there were no Vietnamese American reporters at the time working for mainstream media in the county. There's one reporter, um, in, for the LA Times, but there just wasn't really any representation. And so the type of coverage we saw was um, like um, even in this really large community where people are seen as having a political stake and, um, and being important to a degree, um, there just wasn't that much interesting representation. It was a lot of festival coverage, which is great to a point. You know, there was a lot of like political controversies, which is fine to a point, but you know, it never, people never took it beyond that like exact moment. So um, it helps to have representation because you get nuanced. People come preloaded with the questions and thoughts about identity and like ways to talk about it that, um, that are important in capturing nuance. But some of the limitations too can be who's assigning stories and, and how often people are really tapping into the knowledge of their reporters of color. And that's kind of where um, where it can become difficult to like set an agenda as a reporter and pursue stories. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I just kind of rambled. Yeah, no, I, I think you, um, you, you did T. I think, um, there are some very specific things to consider in terms of where you're coming from, right? If you have, it sounds like the background and your personal experience from within a community that provide some kind of um, benefits in, in terms of how you connect with people and your understanding of community. Um, and it's something that might not be shared if, if it's not 
you know, someone from within the community that's doing coverage. Yeah. And like, sorry, one more thing is um, it, it also led to people assuming I knew way more than I ever did about the community, its politics, the divisions. And I would sometimes my next job at the San Jose Mercury News was also at a very like heavily Vietnamese community. And it just um, an assumption that that shared language or culture is like an automatic ticket to intimacy and like and trust and it's just not um and so that that's what i meant earlier about it cutting both ways is that sometimes editor will editors will assume you don't need to spend time with people and make relationships and that's just it's not true in any community great yeah yeah no i think that's a, a really great insight and i'm wondering annie um with the work that you do um being you know with the coverage that you do very specifically on um, Asian communities, um, what are some of the challenges that you see um, in terms of bringing stories to light and bridging some of the connections you might have with community and across communities that you might also want to share? I'm sorry, I just wrote like all these notes <laughs> over this page off everyone else. So I will start there. <laughs> um, well, first being that there used to be an Asian American Journalist Association here in Denver. Um, at some point there were between 20 to 30 Asian American um, journalists working in, in newsrooms of all various sizes in Colorado. And um, kind of what's been talked about and what Sarah was saying too, you know, every year for the Dragon Boat Festival, we do turn to our Asian American journalists to help like MC the stages, for example. And some years there's more, some years there's not like, you know, sometimes it's very hard to find because the, they leave, you know, and I know so many that have spent some time here, you know, some that even just left the whole industry. And I do think it does have to do with what T's talking about, like, it, are the newsrooms inclusive, you know, because even if you have the Asian American person, you know, you've checked off that kind of diversity box, they don't feel comfortable to share, or they don't have anyone, you know, that they have that, you know, connection or affinity with. And so there's a, that lack of comfort here. And so we know a lot of, you know, Asian um, news anchors, for example, that have left Colorado um, for states and cities that have higher Asian populations, you know. Um, and when we think about the fact that there's only 4% Asian Americans in Colorado, like when we look at just that statistic of our percentage here, and knowing that there's even less that will go into journalism, you know, it, that in itself is a challenge. So I think largely about like how, um, you know, newsrooms and you know, Colorado Media Project has already been doing a lot of this work, but really creating spaces, um, you know, to even build pathways for young people, uh, you know, students of color to go into the industry so that, you know, it's even something that Asian Americans consider for a career to even have representation in the newsroom. So really just kind of looking more upstream. And then I think largely about how important the relationships are, because for instance, right now at 5280 Magazine, there is, um, a Thai American woman that is now the food editor. And so it's just like, for us, it's, she's really been able to cover so many like Asian restaurants in a way that there just was never this coverage before. And it's like, that is important because we know that like our voices are not heard if, you know, people don't even know like what our challenges are. And it's really interesting. She's kind of taking her role, you know, even though she's covering food, but she's really trying to add this kind of like social justice piece to it, like small business. Like she really understands the issues of our community, even though that's not really, you know, like the area she's covering, she's finding a way to help bring to light. So for example, all the Asian hate that's been going on and the violence, she covered Asian restaurants that are doing things for that movement, you know, so just finding ways to do that because there's this kind of more genuine understanding of what's happening. And so knowing that we don't have that kind of level of representation in a lot of spaces, I think just the relationships are important to, to you know, really reach out, you know, to people in the community to have a more you know, authentic friendship that, you know, when something happens in the community that we can just call someone in the media and be like, this is how what's happening. And can you come to our event or, you know, even like a text or a cell phone, you know, like that kind of level of relationship, I think is really important to really make inroads into the Asian community. And so what comes to mind is um, when the villager had ran the article um, last year, that satirical article on April Fool's Day, um, 
basically poking fun at the Asian community, how that was just a very hurtful event in our community. And anyway, I see Dave Perry on here, but he wrote an article in the Sentinel that I think really supported our community. And so just things like that, I think is important to feel like, even though we don't necessarily have Asian American representation in all the newsrooms, but that we have relationships at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I just looked up and will copy that uh, reaction from, I think, Nine News uh, about that villager article that I just found. So um, might be something and some of you might want to just look at. Harry, I think you are quoted in there. Um, so um, I think, Annie, you covered some of the things that are needed, some of the ideas that are important to consider in terms of representation and engagement, right? Like having more of a personal connection, using more of a personal um, communication vehicles um, and, and ways to engage individual people to be able to get to a better understanding of communities and therefore better relationships. So I'm curious to know, um, Sarah, what from your perspective uh, needs to happen for, you know, uh, reaching a better level of representation and inclusion? And I will also ask more specifically engagement, right? Like, this event, this open house was open to all of our partners, our network that really is just over 160 newsrooms across the state. And it was open to the general public. We had, you know, our liaisons that are part of this work, uh, including Annie and you reach out to your networks and invite people in. Um, and it's a small audience that we have tonight. So I'm personally very curious, and I think it would be very important for uh, us to know and members of the media who are also part of this call, uh, what needs to happen so that there might be more interest, that we are more effectively reaching um, members of these communities, not only for stories and sources, but to have the conversations that need to happen before the stories and the sources can be established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, for asking that question. I um, just echo Annie's um, response when it comes to representation. Um, representation in uh, media is huge. It, there is a connection between the different communities and to feel like we are represented um, in, in the um, and the threads that are Colorado. Um, I think that one of the best ways to really get involved with the community is to have a um, strong curiosity and to come out and visit us, <laughs> um, to come out to our events, come out and support our um, panels and, and just uh, things that are put on by the AAPI community. Um, Colorado Dragon Boat Festival is one of the largest um, Asian celebrations in um, Colorado and we are, uh, all Asian and Asian American and general public. So that's a great opportunity for people to come and just see the amount of people who come and support the cultures and arts there. Um, we usually, at least at uh, Colorado Dragon Boat Festival, tend to highlight a specific community um, each year. And that's a good way to kind of interact with, with that community, with those leaders that are really putting on um, important events within the community in Colorado. Um, I would say that really just kind of having the passion and the curiosity to come out to us. Um, and you do have uh, quite a few resources here just on this panel for if you have any questions on what is happening or who to contact, um, we are more than welcome, more than happy to point you in the right direction. Um, social media is a huge um, resource, I would say, for people who are looking to find more events that are coming out of the AAPI community. If you aren't getting Asian Avenue Magazine, you should be um, because it is absolutely amazing. And it really highlights all the amazing things that are coming out of Colorado. Um, as a whole. So I think um, that would be a kind of a, a stepping stone. And then as Annie mentioned as well, just creating new pathways um, for the youth of our communities to get into media, to get into, uh, we have a film festival we, that we just had to get into film, to get into things that are, um, there's underrepresentation um, for minority groups on. So really creating those pathways as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, Harry, what would you add to that um, an answer to this question? What needs to happen for better representation and engagement of API communities in the news media in Colorado? I think, you know, having reporters of color doesn't necessarily have to be Asian. Some of the best stories I've seen are written by reporters of color that are not Asian. Having reporters that also speak the language is very, very beneficial and useful. And, you know, there are so many stories in our community that are just not told because the media are often not aware of it. I mean, if you, I work with a lot of immigrant and refugee communities. If you want to talk about government callous treatment of, of humans, this is the community that's often impacted. I mean, uh, here's an example. So I'm posting a Twitter thread right here. This is a Twitter thread from today that talks about how Southeast Asian countries have different naming conventions, how it doesn't fit the Anglo Western Anglosphere. A few years ago, uh, Nine News, we invited Nine News to come to APDC to do a story because we had a group of combat interpreters from Afghanistan that came to the US, their naming convention does not fit the Western convention. So the Department of State in their infinite wisdom decide to literally rename all of them with first name FNU. FNU stands for first name unknown. So you have a whole family with first name FNU because some callous bureaucrat decides that I don't want to deal with this name in convention, I'm just going to name it. So we had to work to actually change these interpreters that literally work for US military and help save life. And we had to work with the USCIS, DMV, the court system just to change them to, so that they get their real name back. But these are the kind of stories that often goes under the radar. And you know, if you have reporters that what you know that want to build relationship with our community we are happy to give you leads and guides to a lot of these stories thank you harry and i'll echo what susan green said um in the chat wow um it's uh, that's an interesting fact um, I, I'd like to um, now ask this uh, version of this question in terms of what needs to happen um, to our journalists, our panelists, journalists um, here and say, you know, over the years in your experience, what has been one thing that in terms of your work um, you have learned to do that has been effective in this whole issue around this topic around representing accurate stories um, in terms of AAPI communities. What is one thing that uh, you have learned that you would be willing to share with other journalists on the call? Um, I could start. Um, well, two things just because um, to go back to what Harry said, sometimes I think a lot of journalists um, just don't know what questions to ask or what is relevant to a community. And um, a good way to learn more about that is just looking at data. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great data on Asian American communities because they got lumped together poorly. Um, and like state agencies don't always um, like disaggregate stuff. So you're finding out about people based on their national origins, but that's like a good question to ask. But um, there are, they're all like sources of data online, like this website, for example, if you cover politics um, is kept by some professors that do polling and keep detailed um, like national origin or ethnic um, sub like subdivided ethnic group political data and it's all super interesting. There's resources out there that you can look up your community and learn more about what kind of people are living there and where to start. So just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. um, but if to your original question, I think um, asking more questions about identity can be really helpful and illuminating. Um, you know, oftentimes as a reporter, you're working really quickly. You're just trying to find out some basic information about someone, but like spending 10 more minutes, 20 more minutes with this person and asking them about like 
you know, if they identify as Chinese American, what that actually means to them. Do they always have this same relationship to that label? Um, you know, do they identify with Asian American in the context of um, the sort of hate crimes that have been going on? How does it feel to be very visible um, where you live because of your race? If you're mixed race, do you have different feelings about this? And so um, I think this is something that reporters of color tend to do better because we already have these questions in our heart that eat away at our soul. But like um, thinking about that in the context of politics and policy and like how government reaches people and how people make assumptions based on where you're from, those are all super important questions and understanding everything from like local government and who gets reached out to when an election happens or um, healthcare. It's just, um, it's kind of the heart of covering Asian Americans is like knowing where people are from the time they immigrated, how, how many generations they've been in this country, just like really important biographical details can also reveal um, different issues that matter to different communities. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, T. And Annie, I'll ask the same question to you. What is one uh, piece of advice, uh, learning that you can share that in, in terms of effectively reaching and telling accurate stories? Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know how often, you know, like stories, the way stories are assigned in more mainstream newsrooms, right? And I think really thinking about kind of going back to the importance of building those relationships and what T was saying to truly understand just the differences of the community. And I had put in the chat earlier, you know, we have a lot of ethnic differences for sure, like depending on what country you've come from in Colorado and even at APDC, Asian Pacific Development Center, where Harry is, you know, they serve over 30 plus languages, um, Asians coming from all different countries. And so oftentimes people look at that as like, okay, that's how we're different, you know, but then more than that, it goes into just like our generational differences and what he's saying, like, how long have you been in the States? Like what level, you know, of English language, you know, do you have, you know, in your home and, then to just even the political differences. And so some of the challenges in our own community is that we are very divided. And so the coverage often is kind of just told in this one way. And um, it, it just shows kind of this lack of really more thorough understanding of the community or like the individual that's being interviewed for that specific article. And so going back to what I was saying about just thinking about how stories are assigned to, it's like really listening to the community and actually approaching the community, like what's going on in your community? Is there's, you know, events or, you know, things that you really think are important that we should be a part of, like somebody's story that should be told. And I'll just say, you know, my mom and I started Asian Avenue magazine together in 2006. And a big part of why we started it was because Asian weren't being covered in mainstream and at the time you know I've been a part of the community for so long I, I grew up in Denver and just had this feeling like you know <laughs> are we ever going to really be covered and maybe we do have to do it for ourselves and so I appreciate what Sarah's saying about just even like picking up the magazine and reading like what's happening in the Asian community and not always kind of feeling like it needs to come out of the newsroom and you know like the whole what questions should be asked it's like well why don't you go to the community and ask the community kind of what's going on and what I'm really thinking a lot about and just feeling so drained honestly from this week and just again just our work around this one year anniversary of the Atlanta shooting too is just I was on a healing circle recently and somebody just talked talking and you know crying and a lot of these spaces about how just the lives of Asian immigrants are already very hard, you know, and um, just thinking about our families and you know our parents and the sacrifice and all those things and that we deserve to be happy. <laughs> we deserve to celebrate like Asian joy and Asian positive things in the community. And I think a lot of times when we think about when we're covered and especially now with the, the hate crimes, it's, it's always this like, oh, well, something really shocking or jarring or horrible is happening in this community. I think we need to, you know, cover that and, you know, really shifting that going into 2022, especially, you know, for me, I even think about what I'm putting in Asian Avenue. I'm like, okay, yes, I think we do have to elevate the importance of, you know, challenges in the community for sure. Um, but also really celebrate a lot of the unique stories that 
uh, like Carrie was saying, I have never been told, you know, and I think just having the relationship with us and for all of you on, you know, this meeting today, we are happy to build those connections and, you know, help you kind of get in with some of the other people in the community. I think that's really important to us. And so, especially Harry, I always joke that he's like the triage in the community. You just send him a request and he will figure out kind of who it goes to, you know, but just that to not, I guess, feel fearful because you don't have a relationship or understanding yet, you know, that a lot of this does take time and just kind of that initial effort to build, um, you know, more understanding. Great. Well, thanks for ending on that note, Annie. I think uh, celebrating the joys um, is an important theme to um, just, you know, leave this conversation with. And so I, I appreciate all of your input, uh, the four of you. Thanks for being here. Those are really my questions. I'll turn it over to our um, audience now, if you can turn your video back on, I'd love to see your faces as part of this call too. And um, I know we have a couple of questions in the chat. So we'll start with that. And then I'll open it up if you can just raise your hand. Um, so we can, um, you can share some of your questions and our panelists can answer that. Uh, and we can have some conversation. Around those, I'll start with a question by Soon Beng. Um, in terms of media coverage, I think there is a need for it to come from AAPI Center perspective, which provides an Asian reading of events free from any kind uh, of dominant cultural distortions. Um, and I will ask um, Soon Beng if, if you feel comfortable asking your question again. Uh, posting it to the panelists, any specific panelists that you would want to ask that to or just open it up for a conversation, please do so. Sure. Uh, I'm Sun Bing. Actually, I'm with the Colorado Asian Pacific United. Okay. Prior to uh, coming to the United States, I was a journalist with Reuters in London and I was a journalist in uh, Singapore and Malaysia. So my understanding was that there is the tendency of how reporters cover news from one cultural perspective because they're dominant media. So the reading of Asian events and all that is always biased to some degree. So I think that if you want to have a fairer representation of media coverage of the AAPI community, I think it's critical to approach it with how the Asian community read and understand their community. And the challenge, and I pose for now, that it could actually maybe start with how journalists in America are being trained, because you don't see that there could be more than one way of how news are being interpreted. I do understand there's always the newsroom pressure of deadlines and all that, so it is easier to not question the status quo of how current API communities are being represented and take the predictable route of basically going with what the newsroom is comfortable in defining what is news in terms of API community. Many of the uh, panelists raised all these points in terms of representation, in terms of that Asian community is not just one monolithic group, that there's a lack of understanding that journalists don't take the time to learn. So unless there is a, I think, desire to understand the Asian community in terms of how they are represented in the news and question the current status quo. It starts with training because there's always an easier way out of this if you are the dominant culture and you don't really need to explain yourself. But how you represent a whole community it, that is detrimental because you are telling them this is who you are and not what they think they are. And so that's my perspective of why maybe there's a need for an AAPI-centered perspective on news versus a current Western-centered understanding of news. So thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you for being here, Soon Bing, and, and, and I appreciate your question, your thought. Uh, I wonder if any of our panelists have a reaction to that, and I invite other audience members to share their thoughts um, as well.
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think unfortunately a lot of reporters don't have a space to talk about, um, I mean, just how the industry has become so compressed and deadlines with deadlines that a lot of newsrooms don't create spaces for people to talk about these issues and, and, and just get a gut check from someone. Um, I think people are can be overly hesitant to reach out to a source and just talk through something. And that comes from like a lack of long-term relationship building. But just like one concrete example of, I think what you were talking about soon was um, in like my first job, I covered a Vietnamese American community. And I remember talking to um, the publisher of one of the Vietnamese language newspapers. And she was talking about how most of the reporters that worked for them were first generation immigrants. Um, a lot of them decided to cover their community and get into journalism because they didn't speak English and it was a job they could continue to do with really limited English fluency. And so they knew their communities well. They came from a refugee political perspective and um, um, were really important to their community, but they had a specific political bent um, that came from their background as post-war refugees, um, very strong anti-communist bent. And so um, one of the challenges they had was trying to find people to keep the paper alive, like hire younger people. And the second generation Vietnamese Americans like me often didn't speak Vietnamese or write it well enough to write for a newspaper. And they would um, try to hire younger Vietnamese Americans who were raised in Vietnam and educated there, but um, found really profound political differences in the writing. People would use language that had coded propagandistic words that would like trigger everyone else in the community. And so there were like all these interesting just interplays in our own community about politics, where you came from, when you came here, your background, the words you use that um, are just are like super rich and interesting, but a source of division and something that never gets brought up into like the mainstream culture because we don't talk about people in that nuanced of terms. And so I think that's kind of an example of what you were talking about too, just like not knowing um, all the different ways these divisions can manifest in politics, in community, what groups, like what church people decide to go to, that kind of thing. And it doesn't need to be about division, but what it is, it's telling. It's sort of like the rich fabric that makes stories interesting and make people real to other people. And so that's just one thought. I, I actually want to echo what I said about learning the language of the community that you cover. And this is for me, something I found very interesting when you are working as a foreign correspondent, if you, many Asian journalists cover Western countries, they all learn how to speak English. But when a Western journalist covers an Asian community, they only learn how to speak English and not the language of the community they cover. That in a way tells me, why can't they learn English? Because many of the Asian journalists, English is not their first language. So it applies to the same thing. So how you cover news and represent a committee maybe requires journalists to work harder in trying to get to know the community and it starts by maybe learning the language because many Asian journalists do that by learning how to speak English and <laughs> write in English. So something to think about. And this actually goes back to my point that unless those training starts at the schools in journalism, I don't know much will change because we already all have our own preconceived notions of the world and our understanding. And even when I was in journalism school, the books that I was taught in journalism were all written by Western authors. That influences how I see news to some degree and how I would write news in English. So something that we all have to maybe rethink about how journalism is being taught and how journalists are being trained, if we really sincerely want to be able to provide a better media coverage and representation of a VI community in the news. Right, right. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's it's a, um, a very interesting topic for conversation. As I mentioned early in our meeting or call, uh, we will have these working group sessions um, 
that during which we'll ask some of these questions more in depth, right? And we'll go through some of the thinking behind, you know, what's wrong, what can be done better, what are some solutions, like specific recommendations. And I think this is something that should definitely be part of that conversation. Um, I have another question. This is from Melissa Davis. Um, have you seen any non-traditional ways that authentic AAPI voices have been allowed, enabled to tell, tell their own stories? Uh, Melissa, would you like to ask that um, again or differently um, before posing it back to the panelists? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just think it's always great to start with, so, I mean, there have been some really good examples lifted up, but I was just kind of trying to you know, stretch our thinking as far as like, what are some great examples of when it's happened well, when people have felt like um, API voices have been able to just shine through and really let the journalism kind of step back and, and be, um, you know, so, so I mean, I guess I was thinking of like, um, you know, there's like, op there's like opportunities for like op-eds or, you know, first person narratives or things like that. Um, sometimes those are hard to get into broad circulation, but when they are there, it, they can have such a big impact. And um, so I was just trying to think if any of you had examples or had seen them even other places where, where that was done well, it might be a good model. Yeah, Melissa, I had to like really rake my brain to come up with an answer to your question. But in my experience, I really like listening to podcasts, particularly like NPR podcasts, but I think that's because they have the time to like go into this and they can have extensive interview and the nuances. I'm a big fan of like NPR rough translation. I'm not sure how much of that is the balance between like the journalism driven versus the community driven, but I find that that podcast does a pretty good job of doing a lot of that nuances of identity, immigration story, experience, all of that. Yeah, and I think someone had put in the chat too, they mentioned just like the poetic and artistic spaces as being a platform. And I think in addition to that, I, social media has definitely, you know, allowed individuals, you know, not just Asians, but just to be able to have more voice um, kind of directly from the community. And so, you know, there I've seen a lot of news. And so again, not just Asian, but just, it'll be like, just a person <laughs> just shares a story or an experience and somehow it goes viral. And then the news picks it up. And the way the news picks it up is more like, oh, this, you know, TikTok video went viral <laughs> of this family's experience, right? And so I think that could be a way to where then you're really kind of directly getting, um, you know, a story or an experience from just a community person at that level and not just um, kind of going what you're saying the other way where it's like, okay, we want to tell a story about this. Can we go find somebody, you know, versus like, oh, this is actually somebody that wanted to share that story and, you know, put it on their social media first. Yeah. Yeah. Great point, Annie. And uh, Sarah, added a link to uh, YouTube shorts that uh, were shown at the Cardo Boat, uh, Dragon Boat Festi Film Festival and all created by AAPI individuals. So Melissa, that might be another good example. Um, and T mentioned several AAPI oral history projects. Um, that might also be a good model to, to consider. Um, and I, there was another question from Annie Kao um, about, uh, you know, a being a common reporting flaw being omission, invisibility, and failure to ask questions, challenging an all white narrative. Annie, um, would you like to ask that question again to our panelists? Sure. And I know I kind of framed it as a comment, but in, I guess my perspective is I, I love all these opportunities to highlight and showcase. Asian voices and Asian stories. And unfortunately, I don't even see uh, a lot of times reporting get to the, getting to the basic level of acknowledging an integrated Asian existence in just day-to-day -day normalized, operationalized like form of reporting, right? So it's, it's it, so in that particular instance, it was a story about women in leadership and it was glaring to me when I read it that every, there was a photo and it was all white women, three rows of white women. And the reporter 
did not even seem to, I, it's just like a, I would wish that the reporter who was a white male had just noticed or asked like, I see that you are making headway on gender equity. And yet I also noticed that every single woman in this photo is white. And so if that's one of those frustrations where, I mean, maybe that's where the, the bar is so low. Like we're not even, I think, acknowledged as existing in day-to-day -day reporting. And it's almost like a side or extra story when an Asian voice gets highlighted. I'm not saying not to do that, but um, it would be, I don't know, it, does it, if anyone has ideas on how to raise the bar among the, the journalists who are covering, like in all of their coverage, to at least notice when there is kind of glaring absence or invisibility. Yeah, thank you, Annie. And if you could introduce yourself. I'd love to learn more uh, about you and just for the rest of the group, that would be great too. Oh, like now? Oh, I'm- Yeah, yeah, just- I'm, um, I'm Annie Gao. I, I'm actually, a, a, I'm a DEI consultant, but I worked in the ski industry as assistant general counsel at Bill Resorts for over a decade. Um, and I specialize my DEI work in the outdoor industry where I, again, this is a theme, right? I think women of color and people of color are largely invisible in the outdoor space and have been for a very, very long time. So this is something that can't tell, kind of a pet peeve um, when, especially when entire industries, right? You see the same imagery and the same stories again and again, and there's just a lack of um, visibility for all sorts of people of color in some of these, you know, historically white fields. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks for joining us, Annie. Uh, we have about um, seven minutes left total. So I'd like to use the next couple of minutes to get some reactions uh, from the panelists and the audience um, in terms of Annie's question. And then we'll move on to a next just very brief section to talk about next steps, maybe just pose a couple of insight questions for all of you to be thinking about. If you have additional questions that we haven't gotten to, please add that to the chat uh, so we can have that uh, for the next steps for this particular project. Um, any of the panelists want to share any thoughts uh, for Annie? Um, so, Sylvia, if I might, I just... Um, yeah, go ahead, John. Um, I, I just think Annie has touched on a very important a important point that I think is really kind of the universal uh, point here. As a reporter, uh, DEI has always meant to me that the story that I'm doing impacts all different communities. And so, and so the issue, for instance, I'll give you an example. Okay, so we've all seen the stories about setbacks for for wells, right? For you know, they're they're impringing on people's uh, lives, et cetera. Well, what story do you always see? You go to Broomfield, you could go to the beautiful, uh, you know, walking space, the green grass, the people, and so on. It's very white community, and you see this big well, you know, head over here, and people are talking about the noise and lights and so on. Well, the same exists in Commerce City. The same exists all over the state, but you don't see, you know, you you don't go out to the to the uh, to even poorer sections of the of the state, or the the people of color in, in in the Hispanic community, or Latinx communities, or Asian communities, where all these things exist for those same people, and a lot of times, um, going back to uh, to to someone else's comment about the language, the reporters in newsrooms, even people of color, even you know people of of Asian background or whatever, they're, they're reluctant to go to an, to an Hispanic area because they're thinking, well, you know, I don't speak Spanish and so I don't really have any any way to communicate. Well, so take someone who does speak Spanish. And just because you have to ha interview someone um, and they're they're in another language, you can have an interpreter talking to that person and it's not it, it's not a big deal. It's easily done. And if you if you if you really believe in this and you really believe in, in you know, highlighting everybody in the community, there's a way to do that. And, it, and it's, it should be incorporated into like daily reporting on whatever subject you're dealing with. People of color, people of different languages, people in your state all experience this in, in, in different ways. And so I think, I think that's really the problem. I mean, all of a sudden we're saying, well, we have to have this group of people 
you know, reporting about this group of people or this. I mean, yes, it's important to have representation in your newsroom. But I mean, third generation Vietnamese immigrants may not speak Vietnamese at all. And, and you know, they may be sensitive to that community. But if they want to really go out in that community and you're doing a story in their newsroom, they can take an interpreter with them. Uh, because I think we have to be able to reach out to everybody in our state where they are on not just issues of, you know, that we think are unique to one community or another, but on all these issues, on, on all the issues we're dealing with. I mean, whether it's pollution, whether it's the environment, whether it's, uh, you know, it's oil and gas, it's uh, you know, whatever it is. I think that's what DEI is really about. And I, and I think mm -hmm. Andy really, you know, hit on that. <laughs> right. Thank you, because to me, it's like a there's like a, a integrated versus segregated approach sometimes exactly. that I see. Exactly. And I don't see enough of the integrated of like your, the daily, nightly news, right? It's like, are the reporters really asking questions about if you pick a topic, any topic, and are people asking, like kicking the tires on how does this affect this one topic affect a range of communities? That would right. be great to see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. Annie, I know T, you wanted to add um, something. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem, I guess I would challenge John on one comment you made about like taking an interpreter along. I think there's a lot of cultural nuance that gets lost with that and interpersonal relationships. And it's also just like when people look at newsrooms and the faces they see, how they how represented they feel it, it doesn't matter if you're necessarily like from the same ethnic background or speak the same language sometimes people are just uh, more comfortable with a person of color and feel like they can speak to them on a different level and aren't trying to defend their their background or how they come off or tell a different kind of story to placate someone i think that is really important but like to annie's point i think you know newsrooms really do have to create intentional spaces and have a different culture around how they talk about news and share ideas and part of the problem is we just don't really have like a synthetic culture of like talking about issues across um, different beat areas all the time or um, it, it can often fall fall to reporters of color to bring up certain questions and when you're doing it all the time it gets exhausting and you get perceived a certain way and so if newsrooms aren't setting the baseline of like here's a space where we can like proactively talk about these things and it often falls to especially in daily news like breaking moments news when emotions like times when mo emotions are high and the political stakes are high and that's like the worst time to have any conversation right especially a delicate one and so i you know i hear your point exactly because i think a lot of reporters of color get very frustrated in newsrooms because it can be hard to bring something up and then also if you're just the type of person whether you're a person of color or you're white or you're or whatever, like who sees that issue all the time. Um, and there's not a space to bring it up where you're not gonna be perceived as aggressive or attacking someone or, or, or making it personal, then it can be very hard. And so I think a lot of that comes down to like having a real newsroom culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you T. And I, I know we're right at time. Um, I'd like to ask for just a couple more minutes of your time, uh, first of all, to thank you, uh, the panelists, for being here, sharing your perspectives um, and your experiences, examples. Um, I know that, you know, I, I hope that you will continue to be involved in this process, and I, and I appreciate your involvement so far. Thank you to those of you joining us um, as part of this conversation and for your questions and your comments too. Um, this, this work cannot happen without having um, your involvement and your participation. So I appreciate that. I will share my screen one last time, um, very briefly, just to go through next steps. Like I said, this is part of a larger conversation. This is the launching point for a series of working group meetings that will be co-facilitated uh, between me and one of our liaisons with, you know, it's a member of uh, an AAPI community um, locally 
those are the five dates and times for the sessions. If uh, you are interested, uh, if you're a member or identify as being a member of an AAPI community in Colorado, um, this is for you. It's a space to have more of in-depth conversations around this topic and really think about solutions. So it's much more action-oriented and we'll get to a lot of the questions that you had today and think about solutions and recommendations for the news media foundations and community organizations. I added a link uh, where you can just sign up and select a time or a couple of times uh, that you can join us. Um, if this is something all of you can share with your networks, other people that you think might be interested in being part of these spaces, uh, that would be great. Um, at the end of this process, like I said earlier in the meeting, uh, this will go through mid-April, these dates, um, and then we'll prepare a report um, that will have recommendations that will become part of the larger initiative um, with the Black and the Latinx recommendations. So please uh, just take this and share with, with and across your channels. And that's all from me. Uh, thank you for being here again. Um, any other questions you have, any other thoughts, uh, leave in the chat and we'll save this and we'll keep it for the next steps so that we make sure that we're incorporating your thoughts today.